So I've learned, and many of you have had the same experience, that uh, after coming to your first world economic forum, economic forum, you inevitably walk away with a Davos boot story. <laughs> Ajay, what's your Davos boot story? Uh, my Davos boot story is that I bought these boots on my first trip here from a lady who had a store on the promenade and made these as a family set of boots. And I stuck with them, and they're very useful, and I don't fall and break my head, which is a good thing. That's a good Davos boot Although story. Although I do have a crash helmet. <laughs> Uh, by now, I'm hoping that uh, everyone in this room, and beyond for that matter, know that you haven't been the CEO of MasterCard since early 2021, and that in June of last year, you became the 14th president of the World Bank Group. What they probably don't know, Ajay, unless they've been paying close attention, is what you're doing at the World Bank and why you believe it's important. You arrived with and have been implementing an ambitious plan to reform this institution. And maybe we can begin by framing it this way. What was wrong, if you like, with the World Bank you walked into seven and a half months ago um, that drove you to want to change? So I think it's not so much what was wrong with the World Bank. It's what was wrong with the way that the community in that space was looking at priorities. You know, for 30, 35 years earlier, the focus was on poverty and what they called shared prosperity. Essentially, the inequality side of that triangle that you and I have talked about a few times. The, uh, when I became the nominee, I spent the first couple of months traveling, trying to get support from countries around the world and trying to understand their issues. And I ended up meeting 90 countries, either leaders or finance ministers, 90. zero, and 100 civil society organizations and about 15, 20 CEOs from the operator and asset management space. And I came back with two very clear understandings which informed the work I'm trying to do. And the first one was that trying to you know, segregate poverty fighting from climate pandemics, uh, food insecurity, fragility, is kind of a misnomer because these are intertwined. And you know, if you're a farmer in Kenya and you haven't had adequate rainfall for four years, which by the way, it's the fifth year now that Kenya is going through a drought, then for you to believe that the farmer who otherwise sent his two kids to school, hired a farming labor, you know, the guy can no longer afford to keep the cattle he had, so he gets rid of that, loses the milk income, then can't afford to keep the labor. What does he do? Get his girl child out of school and back to work on the farm. So all the so-called gains in poverty, which aligned with, let's send kids to school, particularly the girls, let's get them to be educated, get a real opportunity, it turned in three to four years of the impact of climate on them. So thinking that you can segregate these as a fight is kind of an inadequate way of thinking. So you that had was to really the mission. You had to. You had to say, you have to widen the aperture is how I describe it. You kind of go beyond, you don't drop poverty, because poverty is ultimately a critical issue in the world. But you add livable planet, as in caring about the air and water you breathe, caring about pandemics and fragility and food insecurity. And I think that that was the big piece. There's more, though, as I understand it, to what you're doing than addressing the way that the World Bank faces yeah. the world. Yeah. You're doing things internally, too. Correct. Structure, operations. Correct. Culture. Correct. Tell us about that. So the second thing I picked up was that uh, everybody loved the bank for its knowledge and loved the bank that we had the money to give them, but they all thought we took too long to get things done. And you know, the reality is from the time you start discussing a project at the bank to the time it gets approved by the board, the average time is 19 months. And then it takes nine to 10 months for the first dollar to be put out because those countries where you're putting this out, they don't have the capacity to create bankable projects so easily. If they did, they wouldn't be in the condition they are. And they've got to get approvals from their parliaments and their Congress and their local departments and the like. So the system is slow. And 27 months effectively from thinking about a project to dispensing the first dollar. And then sometimes if it's a hydroelectric dam, it's seven years of work. See, it's decade. Nobody is in politics for a decade. They're all gone. Guys at the bank have changed. The, the loan officer who approved the loan has changed. This is an inefficient and complicated way to administer changes in development. So changing how the bank works inside to create a sense of urgency 
take away the roadblocks that I can do, for, you know, go and argue for governance changes in the bank to enable things to move faster. Those are kind of the things I'm dealing with on the inside of the bank. Are you making progress? And if you believe you are? <laughs> I hope I am. <laughs> Who knows? Tell us importantly, though, how do you measure it? Well, if I'm not making progress, this will be my last Davos in the world. <laughs> As the World Bank. It's a fun thing. <laughs> and I don't know what I'm going to do with the shoes after that. <laughs> um, progress. So first of all, internal progress. External. We've redefined the vision of the bank to say poverty, but with a focus on the livable planet. We've added a special focus on women and young people. Women, because half the world is female, if they don't have the right access to opportunity, you're basically leaving half the world in a non-productive space. There's no way this world can grow and progress if you don't give that half a chance. This is a problem in the developed world where you and I live, let alone in the developing world where my work is principally concentrated. So that's an important part of what I've put in. And the young people, because the global south is full of young people, much higher proportion of young people. And they're a great demographic dividend. If when they're growing up, they get clean air, clean water, and once they grow, they get a job. If you don't do that, that's not a demographic dividend. That's a demographic liability coming your way. And I think uh, if you look at jobs in the global south, this bubble of young people coming through the pipe requires 1.1 billion jobs to be generated in the global south over the coming decade. We are currently on a pathway to generate 325 million. A quarter. There's a small gap there. We need to worry about that gap. And I think that getting the right attention on, on jobs and women and young people is kind of important. The second thing that's really important externally is in Africa, where I think the future of many parts of our opportunity for growth and world productivity and safety will come from over the coming 20 years. Africa. 600 million people are not connected to power. I think electricity is a human right. You don't have electricity, you've got nothing. Nothing. And so uh, we're dedicated to changing that as well. So externally, there's a whole series of things, and we can talk about what we're doing on each of those if you get a chance. But the 19 months that it took from starting the project to getting approval of the board, I'm going to bring it down to 12 months over the coming year. If I can do that, I mean, look, even if I get to 14, I'll declare victory, because 14 is better than 19. But you've got to set a plan. And I have an old colleague here from MasterCard in the audience. He will tell you, I tend to choose uh, ambitious targets, and I'll declare victory if I do 90%, because 90 is better than where I was. And, and I, he, there he goes. Yeah, there he goes. So I'm going to do the same thing here and aim for that. And then there's a series of other things being done inside from career development planning. Right now, a lot of the career in, in the World Bank depends on who you know and when you work with them. I want to change that to what you do and how you do it, which requires really transparent career planning. There's a lot of things to be done to help make people in the bank feel that this is the best place for them to be. You were the CEO of MasterCard for more than a decade. And before that, Ajay worked for many years at Citigroup. You know how... Companies... And Nestle, actually. My, my original my career started in Nestle. It goes without saying, by virtue of your experience, you know how companies work, and you know how to turn a company around. How different is turning around a multilateral institution like the World Bank with 189 member countries? Um, some parts are very common, Eric. So for example, people, culture, what you do, how you do it, the words I was just using, that part is common whether you are a private company or a multilateral bank. It's being there for people, getting them a sense of urgency, empowering them, holding them accountable, encouraging them to take risks, doing the things that leaders do every day, giving them a clear vision, repeating it a hundred times and not getting tired, simplifying what you're doing, cutting out the process and the formality for the core of what you need to get done. These things are common across many places. The difference is in, in a private company, your stakeholders, while they're complicated, there's your board, there's your shareholders, there's civil society, and there's your employees. And then there's governments, whom you're beholden on, if you're a multinational, for the right to work in that country. Here, 
those governments become the principal stakeholder in many ways. And there are really two kinds of governments there. There's the donors and there's mostly the receivers, although some receivers are also donors and that just makes it more complicated. But there's donors and receivers. And the pulls and pressures move in fairly strong directions. And, and all of them, remember this, they're giving you taxpayer money. Once they give me the money, I leverage it through the bond market with my AAA rating, and I'm, that's the magic mantra of the bank. So every dollar I get in capital from the donor countries allows me to raise six for the International Bank of Reconstruction and Development, four for the International Development Agency, which is the grant giving and concessional financing agency for so many countries in the world. The poorest does, countries. It does a great job. I mean, if countries in Africa, there are four countries in Africa going through the G20 expert framework on debt relief, Ghana, Zambia, Ethiopia, and Chad. All four, since the day they signed up for that, get money from us, basically grants, or deeply concessional. They've got about 12 billion from us over the last two years, seven purely extra, half of which, half of the 12 is grant, as in no repayment. That, that international development agency is the lifeline for these countries. What are the magic is therefore is the leveraging of the balance sheet, a dollar to four, a dollar to six. Mm -hmm. that, that aspect of the institution requires you to then go out and raise money from the richer countries who are giving you taxpayer money. Guys like you and I are paying for that money to be given somewhere. Therefore, there is a sense of responsibility that you have to have towards the use of that money. And then on the other side, the guys who are receiving the money, you know, they've got a point of view. Take climate, right? So, so the Western world tends to speak about climate in terms of emissions, mostly carbon dioxide, not enough methane, which is another topic. But that's what they talk about. The receiving countries tend to talk about climate in terms of lack of rainfall, loss of biodiversity, loss of forestry cover, challenges with raising crops with the heat going up, things to do with catastrophes. That's so, you know, these are two aspects, of the, the two sides of the same coin. It's a cause and effect. But if you're not careful and you don't bring your language to talk to each other, you can be like two ships in the middle of the night sailing by each other with fog horns blaring. And that's not a good thing. So the complexity of getting these multiple countries to come together to find the right way, to find the best way to navigate through this, that is quite unique. I know, Ajay, that your brain is swimming with ideas about how to make the institution more effective. Uh, mechanically, if you will, what's at the top of the list? So the mechanical part is somebody asked me, uh, <laughs> digressing, what do you want to be known for when you're done? And I said that I fixed the plumbing. <laughs> and, and they said, what do you mean? I said, you know, the bank's got to work its insides in the best possible way so you can focus on the outsides and get real things done at the speed they need to. It's not that I don't want to be known for livable planet and broadening the aperture. I, it's not that I don't want countries to say, uh, thank God the bank is there. Of course I do. But it will only happen if you fix the way the mechanics work. And what I mean by that is I think the bank is amazing people. For example, if you were, want to learn about the different aspects of water management in the world, from what Singapore does with recycling water 2.3 times every drop of water, all the way to what we do not do in the United States, right, with managing water well, to gray water, desalination, drip irrigation, anything you want to know about water. I have 700 people in the bank who understand water. We have 35 to $40 billion of water projects around the world as we speak. If you want to learn about water, the place has amazing resources, amazingly dedicated people. The question is, how do you make the whole place work smoother, quicker, faster, better, cheaper, all the words we use for the receiving countries. And that, to me, is the mechanics of the bank. The financing needs of the developing world, I mean, hundreds of billions of dollars for basic infrastructure, perhaps more for climate mitigation and adaptation, go way beyond the means of the World Bank, Ajay. There's no way they can be met without private capital. But most private capital doesn't want to take on the risk of investing in emerging and frontier markets, especially now when you can earn 7.5% buying junk bonds. Uh, how do you crowd in private capital and close the gap? So there's private capital and there's private capital. So you've got to be careful about discussing domestic private capital versus international, international private flowing capital. private capital. Within international private capital, you've got to segregate operators 
from financial investors because they all have different mm -hmm. motivations and ways of thinking. Domestic private capital, you'd be surprised how resilient that is, even in countries that are challenged. And they're resilient and they're wanting and creative to invest and do things. There, the role of the bank is different than what it would be in trying to attract overseas capital. So for a minute, let's discuss renewable energy, which is where the topic normally starts from. The trillions of dollars a year that people estimate are required for renewable energy investments are not going to come from our balance sheet or government balance sheets alone. They have to come from the private sector. There, why the private sector? Because the business model is proven for solar and wind. The per cost unit of power delivered on solar and wind is lower than the per cost, per unit cost, sorry, of fossil fuel. It is lower. But why is it then that the trillions aren't flowing in? And mostly it has to do with four issues. Three issues and one opportunity. They're all opportunities eventually, right? In Chinese, the word for crisis is a problem and an opportunity. And you kind of have to think of it that way. So if you, if you think about this clearly, the first one is, if I'm a private investor, do I have regulatory policy certainty in this country I'm going to? So Prime Minister Modi in India announced at the beginning of his first term, middle of his first term, I'm going to reach 30% by solar, 2030. That gave enormous clarity to investors. That this guy was on a mission. He was going there. He may have bumps along the road. He may not get things done exactly as you want, etc. All governments are flawed in that sense. So are private companies. But the fact that he has a North Star that he's going to became clearer. India will exceed the 30%. They're already at, in generating capacity terms, they're at 40% renewable. In actual generation, they're lower because still connecting up the grids and getting the technology to make that happen. There's still six years left to 2030. I think clarity of vision and regulatory policy is the first important thing. The IBRD and IDA, the two arms of our bank that deal with governments, have enormous ability to influence the clarity of regulatory policy in a country by engaging in dialogue with the highest level of government. The IFC, which is our private sector arm, and MIGA and Shoransam don't have that clout, but the bank does. So working better together across our silos provides for a much better opportunity on that front. The second one is even if you get that, there's political risk. So the government could change. They may renege on a commitment. They may change their point of view. They may say, I'm not going to fulfill this. You can buy political risk insurance from what we call our multilateral insurance guarantee agency. And then we can lay that off in the private market because with our imprint on it, we get a better price than you would as the private company, so there's an arbitrage there, and that helps. And we do six to seven billion dollars a year. I think we can do 20 to enable more investment. Triple. Oh yeah, by 2030, definitely. And that's not a padded target, which I'll be happy to get to 18. I'm talking about 20 and exceeding it on that one. The, the, uh, the third thing they care about is FX risk. If you're bringing in dollars and euros and yen, and you're getting paid in local Indonesian rupiahs, and you can't hedge that currency over a 10, 20 period of investment, then years of investment, then that's a problem. But again, there, long-term capital markets locally are very important, but you can also do things in the bank to help with some of that FX risk. If the investor takes a certain amount, the government takes a certain amount, and the bank takes the tail risk, there is a way to encourage investors to cross that line. And then the last opportunity is to scale this up into an originate to distribute model. So you're not parking it on my balance sheet, but creating ESG assets that a Larry Fink of BlackRock would want to buy every day of the week. But if you don't standardize the loans as much as you can, if you don't create similar covenants, similar, similar loan repayments, you can't expect BlackRock to send in teams of people to underwrite the due diligence of 50 different loans of $30 million each. That's not going to get to scale. So there's many things that can be done with the private sector. You just have to bide your time, bite things off, short term, medium term, long term, and do it with a sense of discipline and keep the private sector involved. And in fact, Mark Carney and, and Bloomberg are very helpful in getting us to create this private sector lab with all these 15 CEOs. That's where all this is coming from. Would the World Bank ever do something structured where the risk and the reward in theory are shared, take the lowest tranche with the most risk, but potentially the most return is, and then crowd in the private capital layered on top? I'm not in the business of making return. I'm in the business of enabling the private sector to come in at a level at which their shareholders make the return they should be making for their capital so they don't put it somewhere else. 
very ca- those are very carefully worded statements. Mm-hmm. I'm not trying to make them more return than they should. Neither am I trying to make return per se, because I'm not a profit-making enterprise. Whatever profits and earnings you make in any part of the institution go back into IDA mm-hmm. mostly to help give money to the poorest countries. So that's not what we're trying to do. But would I be willing to say that I should help to absorb, like I talked in the FX case, take the tail risk that nobody else can deal with? Yeah. But what do I do with that tail risk? Do I just let it flow and lose money in my capital and then go back to my shareholders for more? Probably not. I need to find ways to manage that as well. So I don't keep going back to our taxpayer to say, I took this tail risk on that investment. I made a mistake. I'm really sorry. There's 200 million gone. Can you please make me whole again? That's not going to make me back, come back to Davos for very long. So, Ajay, I, that might be a good way to stop coming back. <laughs> I look at what you're trying to achieve, and I can't help but be reminded of the challenges and the frustrations of other multilateral organizations like the World Trade Organization, for example, or the World Health Organization. And I wonder, does multilateralism work in a world of geopolitical tensions and great power rivalries? Absolutely. I, I'm still a believer that multilateralism is the only way we hold our world together. There's too much trying to pull us apart. If we fall into the talking heads that talk about that, then that's a bad place to be. Forecasts are not destiny. Let's just remember that. Forecasts are not destiny. And, and therefore, you know, every time in the world when people predict, oh, this is what's going to happen, and that country is going to keep growing like this, and therefore it will overtake every other country by the year 2022, they're always wrong. Why is that? Because nothing works in a straight line. And so dealing with ambiguity, dealing with the change that you must deal with, is an important part of life. Multilateralism, hard as it may be, challenging as it may be, the need to find common cause is what keeps us going as a civil society. The day we lose that is the day we go back into a much earlier point of time. And this, Eric, we cannot afford. Do I believe, therefore, it's possible to do? Yes. Do I believe it's hard? Yes. But, you know, as I said at a different dinner yesterday, journeys are fueled by hope, but realized by deeds. And deeds are what matter. And so people need to stop talking about this and caring about multilateralism. I'm not saying you shouldn't care about national security. I'm not saying you shouldn't care about putting your people. I get all that. But somewhere in life, we are an interconnected world, and the air is fungible, and we breathe the same air, and therefore we have to get to the game of caring about the world we live in together. And I think if you talk to... I I met the Chinese premier when he just became premier, and he's here in town Mm -hmm. for the last couple of days. And I knew him earlier when he was the mayor of Shanghai because, uh, as Lingai will tell you, was sitting back there, we were doing work with the government of Shanghai at that time. The first thing he said to me, yeah, sure, there's issues in multilateralism. Here's three things we all need to work on. Healthcare, the pandemics in healthcare and aging, climate, and rural development. Absolutely. So you have to find the places where the common cause is enough for you to keep multilaterals, uh, multilateralism's flame alive and burning with health. And that's what I believe in. Since you brought up China, uh, do you believe, Ajay, in your heart of hearts that the U.S. and China will be able to coexist as strategic adversaries or are they headed toward a confrontation? No, I think they definitely will. If you look at the way uh, the, the conversation with them has changed, it is beginning to change in the right direction. I think there's pragmatism on both sides to realize that there is space in the world for both. The reality, Eric, is that for all kinds of reasons over the last 30, 40 years, the world grew and developed because of a certain form of globalism, which worked. In in my old board meetings with MasterCard many years ago, someone must ask me, what keeps you up at night? And I said, uh, aside from the fact that my wife might be snoring, which is not true, uh, but that is just my (laughs) sense of humor at work. (laughs) That's my crazy sense of humor at work, for which she hasn't forgiven me till today. Uh, but I, I, uh, but if I did say that chauvinistic nationalism is a fear. And unfortunately, I've been proven to be right, that chauvinistic nationalism is pulling apart the magic mantra of allowing us all to work together. Now, here's the kind of concerns I have. 5G, for example, the standards were set before the world began pulling away into groups. And, you know, maybe we had a unipolar world for some years. 
I don't think we've got a multipolar world right now. We've got this peculiar polarity where countries make friends and align on issues with different countries depending on what the issue is. So we're neither unipolar nor multipolar, not bipolar. We're some kind of, I don't know what we are. We are we're something else right now. And maybe this will change and evolve too. But in that world, um, 6G standards, which are getting created, may not be common. At that point, the power of this digital connectivity may need a different way of working because standards will diverge. And the world grows on standards. Imagine if you didn't have standards on flying aircraft around the world. If the, if the different air traffic controllers didn't work on a standard, how would we get around the world? Standards are critical to getting multilateralism, globality, and the world to work well together. So I think national security is one thing, but standards are another thing. And I think the world, and China and the US, are beginning to find common ground on some of these discussions. That's what I see. Well, we have a couple of minutes left. Two quick Davos, if you will, questions. Um, will the emergence of AI be a net positive or a net negative for the developing world? <laughs> That's just the vanilla flavor of the year this year at Davos. So everybody thinks AI is the future of mankind, or not, depending on where you're coming from. <laughs> you know, by next day, we'll be discussing something else, although we shouldn't. AI actually is quite interesting. Um, like everything else and every other technology, the idea that you should just embrace the technology without caring about the guide rails is, to me, a very daft thing to do. So I believe that you should embrace the technology for what it can do and is doing, in drug development, in cancer fighting, and I mean, across the world in various things. But having guide rails around it is going to be quite important. I'm not quite sure how those guide rails will get created. And I think that's a bigger challenge to me. But otherwise, you know, AI is here to be, so we better get to learn to live with it. I think it has an enormous possibility on productivity. But similarly, it has an enormous negative opportunity on skilled jobs, actually. Not in terms of reducing jobs, but in changing the nature of those jobs. Coping with all that is going to be quite a challenge over the coming decade. Um, Donald Trump is no great fan of foreign aid, and there are many isolationists inside the Republican Party in the United States. What happens to the World Bank if Trump is re-elected president? Well, during Donald Trump's first uh, term, the World Bank got a capital increase and the United States contributed. So I disagree with that statement. Okay. Right? And, and I think that at the end of the day, uh, President Donald Trump in his first term, when he was there, who knows whether he gets elected or not, I, I'm not qualified to comment on that. But, but in his first term, he did support the World Bank. And I know him and his advisors reasonably well over that period of time. I would tell you he kind of understands the importance of the multiplier factor where you give me a dollar of capital and it becomes six. As I told someone the other day, and this is a, the fact, the way the shareholding of the bank is constructed of IBRD is that if the United States puts a dollar up in capital, for the others to keep their shareholding at similar levels, you might move up by a percentage here or there. You've got to put in six in total from the rest. So that gives you seven. If I can lever that six times, that's 40. You tell me any other program in any government where a dollar leads to $40, and I'll give you a medal. And so, so they all get it. The math is clear to everybody. Multilateralism in this form pays. And so, you know, I'm, we'll deal with politics and government the way we have to. That's part of what multilateralism is. I don't get fussed about that. I'm just, I'm just privileged to have the opportunity to be sitting here today. And here's where we'll finish. The World Bank celebrates an important birthday. Yeah. In 2024, turns 80. Needless to say, I'm pretty close to what I'll be by then. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Over the course of those eight decades, the World Bank has left a mark on our economy and our society, much of that positive, some of it, as you know, heavily criticized. As you look back over the 80 years and the 13 World Bank presidents who preceded you, is there someone to whom you see yourself as maybe a spiritual heir, somebody whom you want to emulate, to channel, in your term as the World Bank president? McNamara. McNamara. I think what he did to construct the idea of global cooperation, and I think what he did to construct the basic logic of the bank is unrivaled. Many people have left their mark on it. Jim Wolfenson left a great mark and was a good friend of mine, and 
And because he came to Siri after that, we got to know each other. He left a great mark. But, you know, he inherited some that he could build off. McNamara had to build from scratch. And I think history will judge his role at the bank quite favorably.